Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our panel session. Um, yes, I'm the group CEO of Beasley and Fantozzi, and I'm the moderator for our panel today. It's a very exciting topic. Before I get on to that, who is our expert panel? We've got Ross Campbell, who's the chief underwriter of Genry Life and Health UK. We've got Alpesh Doshi, who's the founder of Fintricity, which is a technology advisory firm. And Robin Mertens, who I have to say I've known for many years, uh, is an independent consultant from Otter Limited. So I'm looking forward to all your views, gentlemen. And as a reminder, you can see the topic up there. It's on technology, the trends, the hyperbole, hopefully cutting through it and dealing with a cultural lag in the insurance industry, if indeed we think there is one. But before I go on to the panel and ask them some questions, and hopefully some from you guys, I'll just give you a bit of context from Beasley. I've been the group CEO at Beasley for six years now, and I've seen it develop quite a bit over that time, but this topic is very close to my heart. So we're a specialist insurer. We write classes such as marine, property, liability classes, DNO. We write a lot of cyber, data breach products, one of, one of our more pioneering products that we've written for the last five years. And we write reinsurance. We actually have a reinsurance subsidiary based here in Dublin. We have over 30 offices globally. And we like to think of ourselves as innovators in the specialist insurance market. We try to innovate by bringing out new products all the time to our market. Now, although we're a young company, I think relatively young, we're 31 years old, younger than me certainly, we are still a conventional insurance business or conventional reinsurance business as I see it. We trade through our brokers, sometimes through quite long distribution channels. We have legacy IT platforms from companies we've acquired or through organic growth. We have legacy process that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, I think we still have too much paper I, right now, am talking to you from a piece of paper. I could be quite easily doing it from an iPad. So there's paper throughout our business, and I'm pretty sure, certainly what I see back in London, there's tons of paper being passed around in all the trades, things being signed off all over the place. I'm not seeing much electronic processing. Now, we've fallen a li little bit for the, what we are describing here as the hyperbole. We've started to experiment. We've nipped away at the edges of technology. So we, we do a bit in big data. We have some data scientists. We've got some robots at Beasley, or RPA, as it's known now, robot process automation. Um, we've dabbled in machine learning and AI, but only just dabbled. Um, and more recently, we've been doing more with natural language processing, uh, also known as NLP, and social scraping, where we draw down information from public sources to help uh, us analyze risks. But it is still experimental. It's not really changing our business. And the clue with that for me is that I've actually put all of that in a separate division in Beasley called Beasley Labs. I'm actually saying to myself, if this is experimental, we'll try it out somewhere else before we introduce it to the business. But this needs to change. And it certainly changed for me about a year ago I was talking to one of our non-exec directors, uh, Sir Andrew Lickerman, who heads up the London Business School. And he was looking at our business. He saw all the paper being passed around, the face-to-face -face trading. He'd also seen the distribution chain that we have. And we actually, we write a lot of business in the US with surplus lines, brokers. We can see 25% commission go in the US. The same risk then gets carried over to London see another 25% commission going there. So sometimes the customer's paying 50% points of commission before the risk has actually been placed. So he asked me, will this all be the same in 20 years' time? Will there still be all this paper? Will the customer still put up with all that commission and all that distribution chain? I don't think it will. Then he asked me, well, why aren't you changing it now? Because the technology's here right now to change that. 
and I didn't really have an answer. And at that point, we decided to go on a journey of digital transformation, and we've just started our strategy for that. And that's why this topic is so important. And at this point, I'm going to ask my first question to Alpesh. What is digital transformation? It's a, it's a fascinating question for me because I have to answer that question pretty much every day with, with people we deal with. Um, just to qualify a bit more about what Ian said, um, we're actually, I'm actually an entrepreneur and we're building businesses on the, the basis that traditional companies, frankly, cannot move quickly enough and change quickly enough. And the insurance industry, as we know, is, is pretty slow moving compared to other industries which we work in. Um, and so, so from my perspective, but digital transformation really is actually a complete business transformation. And there are sort of four areas that, that we consider as part of a digital transformation. One is a market model. And if you look at new emerging companies that have been around maybe five or six years, like Airbnb, they have changed the market for hotels, for example, completely changed it. And insurance, similar things are happening. Things like the on-demand economy are, um, are creating new opportunities and new business models. Um, the second thing is the business model, is how do you make money? You know, Ian's saying 50% of, 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 of the cash that's generated goes through, uh, goes through commissions. So if you look at business models and disintermediation, that is going to transform completely. Digital models enable more efficient relationships between a customer and a, and a company. And those digital models are going to transform how companies make money. Thirdly, it's around technology transformation. So one of the, one of the key areas is around blockchain. I'm sure some of you heard of, heard of the word blockchain, but that's only one element of um, a whole technology transformation that you have to go through. Um, and it's technology, not, of it, not in and of itself, but actually what can it do for your business? And thinking about technology as an enabler and a capability enabler to figure out, okay, how do I mix the different technologies into my business? And finally, how do you integrate technology into your operating model? So if you're thinking about an operating model, and you think about new economy companies like, uh, like Facebook or Amazon, you know, their operating model is built end-to-end -end in an agile way. They change their business frequently. They're a learning organization. They invent things, they implement them, and test them very, very quickly. It's not weeks or months or years before they test a product. They do it literally <coughs> in days, hours, even. You know, and and if, if it works, they scale it. If it works, they implement it across their business. If it doesn't work, they, they can it and they keep going. So, those four areas are really, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do, undergo a digital transformation, those are the four areas you need to consider. Um, and unless you're thinking of, about your business like that, um, you're missing out one of the four quadrants that, that I mentioned, then actually you, you know, you'll probably fall short. Thank you, and, and Ross, you're looking at this from the other end of the telescope. <laughs> How, what does digital transformation mean for your business? Digital transformation in life health means a number of things, I think. Um, I mean, there's a number of areas that uh, we could use technology to uh, help more people access the products that we offer. Not enough people engage with life and health insurance. They don't know maybe where to start with it, and it doesn't feel so relevant. So there are ways of engaging with people uh, that will uh, we'll use technology to improve that. And then there's something around the services that we provide. Um, in life and health, we sell a po policy that might, might last um, several decades, and we may not speak to the customer in between. Uh, so there's opportunity to innovate in that gap, to provide services and things that um, people actually want. Um, and then in my discipline, which is underwriting, so that's risk selection, there's clearly opportunity to use different um, ways to assess risk. Um, and by that I mean some of the profound digital knowledge that people will begin to hold about themselves uh, and that they may expect their insurer to take into account when pricing their, uh, their policies. And importantly, uh, traditionally, insurers approach uh, individuals, um, medical service providers, for insight into these kinds of risks. And going forward, uh, a significant amount of that data will actually be held by the individual and not by the doctor. So insurers will need to think about where they go uh, uh, and the questions that they ask uh, in order to, to help people um, uh, buy policies effectively. 
So is transformation maybe a strong word? Because that suggests it's all changing at once, but there are multiple layers to this. Yeah, thing. it's a good question. I mean, I don't think transformation for our life and health means that we'll think of a new way of um, ensuring a person's life. I mean, the nuts and bolts of the products that we have are broadly not going to change any time soon. But it's the way people engage with it, the way we price it, uh, the way we give service around it. I think those things uh, are ripe for, for change. And again, you're right, transformation sounds like a, you know, something's going to fundamentally sweep away everything. And that's possible, um, you know, if, if insurers don't create a, a, a nice digital experience for customers, well, somebody else probably will. Um, but I'm seeing transformation more as an opportunity now to, to bring it into business as usual in a re relatively short space of time by engaging with it and seeing, well, what can we do with it? Um, and, and that would be transformation. Can I slightly disagree? Well, you can. Because I think, you know, we talked earlier about one of the ventures we're working in around healthcare and better health, as I wish I mentioned to you. I think being able to collect data around an individual opens up opportunities around new products and services. And obviously, one of the things you said is about engagement. You don't engage with a customer for, for a while. Well, actually changing the engagement model, using the data that's available through, through um, these kinds of applications, actually can give new opportunities around new products and services and engagement. So I think, I think it isn't just about let's digitize the process, it's about inventing because you have new capability. Totally agree yeah. with that. Um, I, I don't think we can use, we can use some technology to improve some of the existing processes, but rather than spend time making those processes quicker, we probably need to think of new ways, yeah. right, to engage with people. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a lazy answer to say that you know, millennials particularly don't think of life insurance, they don't think it's important, um, but because, you know, the, the profound things that happen to people as a result of living life, <laughs> um, illness, injury, sickness, these kind of things will uh, interfere with, even millennials will, will have some disruption in their life. So we need to create ways of, of, of engaging with these people also. I think you're both right, actually. But, um, uh, on... So, um, Robin, digital transformation. Now, firstly, you've worked for a good 20 years electronically trying to transform the market. <laughs> so, um, what about digital transformation? Yes, I, I started the process of trying to persuade the industry to go digital in about 2000, and I, I, I won't say I wasted 15 years, but, but I, I feel as if I bear the scars. Uh, and, and the whole word in Shortech, uh, which is kind of uh, the zeitgeist right now, really only entered the parlance two years ago. So this whole, uh, you know, we need to panic, the world's going digital is, is incredibly new. And I make the observation that you've got to draw a distinction between consumer-facing digitization, the SME market digitization, and then big specialty enterprise type. All the money is being spent, in, in my estimation, well over 90% on the consumer engagement front. So the way in which a consumer wants to engage with insurance companies is changing. So the money is being spent by the Axis and the Avivas and the Alliances of this world who can afford it to, to provide uh, consumers with better ways of engaging. So if you, if you fly a drone these days, you will have an app called Verifly, there are others. As you go out to fly your drone, it knows who you are, it knows where you are, you select the drone you're flying, you select how long you're going to fly it for, you say buy, it'll give you a price, deduct it from your bank account, and your drone is insured to fly for the next two hours probably also gives you the weather and the various other sort of things to look out for. If you're a drone flyer, that's completely transformational. I mean, you, you know, you didn't have that ability before. And that, so that's where the money's being spent. Now, it's only just started in SME. So there are huge opportunities in SME to take some of the stuff that's been learnt uh, in commercial, in, in, uh, in consumer, into commercial. And I don't see any difference in the way that big risk managers buy their insurance from big insurers these days. I, I think it remains primarily an advisory business and the information is the same information and the risk judgments are being made in a very similar basis. The one thing that is happening throughout the value chain, through, through, through 
consumer to SME to enterprise is the collapse of the value chain. So uh, I always use Amazon in this example. Amazon completely changed the way we buy because they provide the best form of engagement that is out there in, in anybody's language. And they can even now start selling us cars, not because they know anything about cars, because they can engage us as a, uh, as a consumer and, and, and they will find the partners to provide them cars. Just the same kind of dynamic is starting in, in insurance now. So if you watch what Munich Re uh, are doing with digital partners, they are basically engaging with, if not buying or investing, in every smart insure tech app so that they can provide their capacity their license, their know-how, their historical data, and plug it into an app. And a lot of that business is the business that Ian's organization used to see after 50 points have been deducted off it, having gone through five pairs of hands on the way. That now is coming direct from an app to a reinsurer who's saving himself 45 or 50 points and is writing profitable business in those classes for the first time in many a year. And if anyone says to me, why should I be engaging with InsureTech, it's not so much I need to understand AI, I need to understand blockchain. It's to understand what's happening around the collapse of the value chain because that's happening right now. One of the bits of it is, as you've been talking, I didn't mention it when I, when I answered the question, but um, if you look at some of the companies I mentioned, like Airbnb and, and Facebook and others, they're all platforms. And there's a specific definition of a platform, uh, which I, I don't have time to tell you about. But there's a guy called Sangeet Chowdhury. Have a look on the internet. And, and there's a, an article in the Harvard Business Review called <coughs> Pipelines and something or other. Uh, reach out to me on, on social, social media and I'll, I'll send you the link. Um, but the important thing is that every new business that, that we're working on is platforms. And as he's been talking, I was thinking to myself, actually, you know what? You could actually build a platform, platform model and ecosystem in insurance, which would allow you to have a granular type API-based insurance product where anybody could build an app, plug it in very quickly, uh, without all the faff that normally you have to do to get insurance, and get insurance. So one of the use cases we're working on in, in, in Asia is uh, on-demand insurance around Uber. So there's a local version of Uber in Indonesia and Malaysia called Grab. And what we're doing is offering a platform through a mobile operator who's our partner there, who can literally offer the Grab driver uh, trip insurance where the, when the driver clicks start the ride, the insurance starts, and click stop, and the insurance finishes, because there, there isn't any insurance for the, for, the, for the passenger. And that's in a platform approach. The ease of integration, the API-based approach to integrate into an app, the delivery of the product on demand in a granular way, with a new data, and a, 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 a data using data analytics to build a new underwriting model. So that, that is mm -hmm. the the kind of opportunities that we're seeing. And that opportunity, it sounds like, is, is, is that a new type of insurance risk that was found? Because I think part of the challenge we have with yeah. in, in sure tech and yeah. uh, transformation is we're talking about transforming something that already exists, but yeah. you're, you're talking about something, a completely new channel. Yeah, so if you take the characteristics of what that involves, there's the digital delivery channel mm -hmm. using a platform approach. There's the fact that the mobile operators have huge amounts of data which they can give you on which, with other types of data, you can build a new underwriting model. There's the digital end-to-end -end activation of that insurance. And potentially, even to the other end, I mean, we're talking about granular insurance, right, for a few dollars, but if you aggregated that, you could digitally underwrite it with a reinsurer in a marketplace and say, hey, guys, look, I've got 100 million of insurance that I want in the next six months out of the reinsurers. I'm going to barter into a market and say, Who's, who, wants, who wants to take a piece of it? And so you could actually can replace the complete end-to-end -end value chain um, digitally end-to-end. -end. And one of the big things, as, as we know in, in, in most insurance companies, is, is the oper operating costs and the claims process. You know, for us, you can actually, as it learns, right, this is not going to happen overnight, but you can collect the data and learn about when a claim happens and, frankly, pay out. Just pay out rather than having a, a complex and expensive claims process. Learn the model, and you're not going to get it right 100% of the time initially. It's going to iterate, and you'll, you'll get better at it. But learn, and then actually just make pay the claim. So that really, sorry, just there's one real example, right? There's something called EtherRisk. If you haven't seen EtherRisk, have a look. What they've done is they've built an insurance model on the blockchain, which pays out when there's a flight delay. So if you buy flight delay insurance, you can go to their website, you can buy the insurance, and if there's a flight delay they will pay automatically if you're delayed for three hours. 
No underwriting, no nothing. You can literally, right now, go and do that. Um, and those are the kinds of models that are emerging, where <laughs> you literally can pay out without having to. And because you can get the data, so you know, when a flight is delayed, that's recorded, it's fat. So you can get that data and say, yeah, it paid, it's, um, there was a flight delay three hours and automatically pay the claim without having to try and work out the claims process. So these are the kinds of models that are optimized. already emerging. Fully optimized. Fully optimized, end-to-end -end digital, no in human intervention at all. So it, there's a lot of insure tech companies that are doing just this, and it sounds like you're working with quite a few of those. Robin, I looked at your bio last night, and it says that you're a dating agent. Yeah. So um, does that have anything to do with insure tech, or is that a sideline? Well, I'm, I'm building the app. Uh, you know, I always call myself a dating agent. I spend evenings uh, in, in uh, pitching... Uh, hearing of young entrepreneurs pitch um, businesses trying to work out what I think is good and bad and I spend the day uh, putting on a tie and going to boardrooms trying to um, sell those ideas to the people with the deep enough pockets to invest in them. Uh, and uh, we're at a really interesting stage now because um, those entrepreneurs two or three years ago were calling themselves disruptors and they were trying to build full stack in short tech plays where they were going to be the next Aviva. Um, and, and you could hear them, they were great fun. People would turn up uh, and say, I'm going, I've worked for three years in the Aviva marketing department. It's a really crap experience and I'm going to show you how it works from here. And you'd say, well, what do you know about pricing? What do you know about regulatory compliance? What do you know about capital management? What do you know about... They didn't know anything about any of those, but, but they, they thought they could build an insurance company. Two to three years on, what's happened is that there's been a complete understanding of where the entrepreneur can play and where the incumbents play. So there is a lot of insure tech collaboration, cooperation going on in the engagement space, which I've just described, and then secondly around uh, in analytics, uh, the use of artificial intelligence, better predictive modeling, better behavioral insights. Uh, basically a fundamentally better uh, way to assess price uh, and select risk than exists right now. Uh, and in those two areas, there's a, there's a lot of um, symbiosis because the uh, entrepreneur doesn't have to raise 120 million pounds to uh, build a fully capitalized insurance company. Uh, he can leave all of the capital management and the pricing and uh, to the insurance companies and, and, and concentrate on the things where entrepreneurs can really, really make a difference, which is around the assessment of the risk and around improving the, the engagement model. And I don't know how long it'll last, but there's genuine sort of um, cooperation and symbiosis between the two communities right now, which means we're, we're all sort of getting along. Good time to be a dating agent. It's good money in it. Good. And Ross, uh, from your perspective, you've been involved as well in insure techs at January. Yeah, um, I mean, startups uh, that are the I guess that's the generic name, and um, Startup Bootcamp is, a, is an organization that we, we got involved with in the UK. Um, and, and what struck me about meeting the people who were involved in these startups um, during that sort of incubation period was, was precisely this kind of openness and, uh, and willingness to collaborate, not just with, with, with us, um, but with each other. Um, and I get this sense that there's this there's this opportunity for, for very profound collaboration over the next sort of 12 to 18 months while it sort of settles down um, and becomes business as usual. Um, and that's a, an opportunity that we should grab. Um, startups are agile and flexible. They make decisions very quickly. They learn very quickly. Um, we, we tend to let them get off and raise their own money and so on. Um, because I think it's important that while for some, being involved with a large corporation is the end game. Many want to stay independent. Many want that kind of, um, that feeling of ownership. Uh, and I think we sense that generally that uh, it is this possible you could squ almost squash the life out of the innovation by, by making them fit to what we already do. And I caught myself doing this very early in the process um, with a company that was interested in engagement. Uh, and you know, I briefed them and then they came back and showed me what we already do. 
but it, electronically. And then I said, no, I'm sorry, that, that's, that's no good. I'm leading you down the garden path. I want you to think of something new. Um, so I think, yeah, startups offer a huge opportunity, but they do need to be nurtured by uh, the incumbents to, to really s sort of scale up. Um, and we can give them a lot of help, uh, a lot of information, fill in those missing gaps, and they can go away and see how that fits with their technology. Um, and often do and come back with surprising results really quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about engaging and, and, and sort of really trying to innovate alongside these uh, entrepreneurs and people with these ideas. Can I, can I say on the other flip side, however? Because, uh, I, you know, I, I know lots of startups and I'm a mentor on some, on, on some. And one of the things that a lot of startups, you know, guys in their 20s who think they want to reinvent the world that, that Robin's saying, and what they do is that they get, they get overawed by a big brand, a big well-known brand, you name any brand, who are all have innovation teams now and they have some of them accelerators. And what happens is these, these 20, young 20, 25, 30 year olds get really excited because a large brand is engaged with them to do something. And what happens is they have an expectation that they're gonna set, have them as a customer. And a lot of times what happens, and I've seen, I don't know, I can name you lots of these startups, is they go through the process in a large organization and spend nine months trying to get them as a customer um, and there's one accelerator I can name you where they, they have like a cohort of 15 companies from a 400 to 15 and then they say oh, we'll take you into our business this is a bank and almost invariably none of them get none of them get that particular accelerator as a customer and all of them are disappointed by the end because they've spent nine months or whatever it is six 12 18 weeks nine months whatever it is getting nowhere and I've seen that so many times with startups where they get they get engrossed by this brand and the, the people in the organization, no disrespect to you, but you know, lots of people in these organizations want to engage and frankly learn from these guys. But the reality is the match between a startup and how they think and work and trying to sell their product or service to a, a larger company fails almost every time because most of these guys don't understand enterprise sales. They don't understand the complexity of a large organization and how decisions are made and who makes decisions, how things are bought. You know, and they get and they get frustrated. Honestly, they get frustrated, and I've seen that. And so I am really wary of when a startup says, "I want to go to an accelerator." And we've been asked with our, some of our ventures to go to an accelerator. And I just said no, because we know I know how it works, and I, and that's my gripe around large corporations working with startups. It, it frankly would waste their time, to be honest, from what I've seen. I'm not saying there are not successes, but mo majority is that that nothing very happens. Oh, so there's some good and bad stories on insure tech. That's what I'm picking up from that. Well, I think I don't know about insurance. So insurance is different. I don't know about insurance. I'm talking about outside insurance. Maybe <laughs> Robin will know more uh, about yeah. insurance. But outside insurance, that's my experience. I suppose it's a combination of these are new companies, and they may not necessarily know what to ask for from a large corporation. Yeah. Um, and I suppose looking at it from the other side is that you see a, a company that's may have already described itself as a disruptor and it's potentially seen as a threat and it's not actually the yeah. best start to a, a working relationship. I, I, I sort of disagree with you to this extent. The best innovation is coming from outside the industry. So that's great. But you can't get very far in insurance unless you understand a lot about how it works. So to my original point about the I've worked in the marketing department. I know how it works. Yeah. Um, so, so somebody has to give you the domain knowledge. And, and you do one of two things. You either go and hire people from the industry to come and help you. And the industry is, on the whole, overpaid. And it doesn't actually have that many people who want to go and work in a bed sit for 28 grand a year while they sort the stuff out. So it's very it's difficult to get the domain knowledge to transfer to the insure tech. Yeah. Uh, so you, in the end, you end up having to go to the insurance company to tell you how it is you need this stuff, because actually there isn't any alternative. And the other thing you need is data. Uh, and, and the reason why the symbiosis is so important is that you can build all the self-learning algorithms you like, but if no one will give you any data for those things to learn on, they're not very good self-learning algorithms. So getting the data, the historical data, or the, the data about customers to enable these self-learning artificial intelligence type technologies to do their thing is, is a key part of it. You can't get the data if you don't cooperate with the industry. So we've, uh, we've named one or two of the technologies as we've been talking. So that leads me to a question from the audience, actually. 
um, which is, is one problem with the uptake of digital solutions in the marketplace that people do not immediately understand the terminology being used and are either too shy or too busy or to ask the right uh, question to find out the right answer. I, I would say, so I, I would say the, the, it's the problem of the company trying to sell the technology. It's not about the technology. I said the word blockchain, but actually when I'm talking to senior executives, I never talk about blockchain. I talk about what it can do and what, what business value it is. You focus on here's the things you could do, you could do the that you couldn't aspects. do before. And that's the important thing. A lot of people are, let's be honest, right? Things like blockchain and AI and machine learning, frankly, gets you through the door. Because people want to learn about it. You know, it's if, if a, if a company um, knows nothing about it and you've got a senior executive and somebody's willing to come to a meeting and explain it to you for nothing, they're going to go, well, let me do that. And I, honestly, I get that all the time. People want free education chess sessions and we're not going, no, no, no education sessions, no more. Because, you know, you can spend all your life just going on free education sessions. But the important thing for me is you, you don't go and talk about blockchain as a technology. You talk about what it can do and what the business value is and how it can transform your business um, and combining with other things, it isn't just about blockchain, it's about the suite of technologies and, op and business models. Yeah. And I think there's, what we see in, in, in the technology world is people are very focused on the technology and how sexy it is. If you, if number of startups in, in AI and machine learning and blockchain, they're all focused on technology. They're going, I can do this sexy stuff with technology. And that's the gap. The gap is that sexy stuff with technology is great, but the, the people who are building it can't translate that to a business problem and explain it to the business uh, and, and what, why it's useful to them. Yeah, it's very important that businesses speak the language that customers understand and, and, and link with them in a, in a way that's meaningful. Um, so there's quite a lot of talk about um, the distribution model of the, of the insurance business actually being changed so that you put the customers in the middle um, and start with customers and build to the products around them. And, and yeah, I get that, but it, you know, in practice that might be quite difficult to do. Um, but it's, it's, it's something I, I, I sort of genuinely believe we need to, need to address. Um, not enough people buy life insurance and, and not enough people buy uh, insurance that pays when they're too sick to work. Um, we need to get these products into the hands of more people. Um, and it's not just for, our, for the good of our business. It's, it, it, insurance is a social good. It's something that people need, uh, but they don't often see it. And even if they do see it, they don't know how to get it. Uh, and and uh, again, yeah, the language and the simplicity of engagement is it's obvious in the delivery of other services. Uh, it's almost painfully simple. Um, but in life insurance particularly, uh, it's a very difficult uh, process. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not, not it's, an easy thing to be involved in. I think in. it's financial services in general. Oh, if you talk okay. to anybody and say, what's a, un what's a unit trust and why do you want to buy it? They won't know. You know? I want to invest your money. People don't understand financial products and insurance. I would, let's say that's the umbrella. I think the, challenge, the biggest challenge in, the, in, in, the, in general is the fact that people don't understand financial products. You know? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> don't I, understand I, what the insurance. Maybe in, it may be in danger of focusing too much on, on uh, the life and health side, but but I think people understand they need motor insurance if they have a, a vehicle. They, they they think. I need travel insurance if I'm going on yeah. holiday. But they don't immediately think that they need income protection if they're yeah. working, and even if they're an entrepreneur yeah. in a startup. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to the, a number of these people, and they've said to me at some point, actually, it's just dawned on me, I don't have any life insurance. And talking to you has made me realize I ought to have some. So perhaps everyone just come and talk to me about it. Maybe that's the easiest thing. <laughs> there you go. The easiest thing. You can so make good commissions. <laughs> so it's a go direct to make good commissions. But, but that's the point. If you have the conversation and in a way that people understand it, it, the, the lights go on and they say, you know, yeah, I get it. <laughs> and what, what about within your organization, Ross? Because um, part of the, our talk really is about the cultural change. So the technology is it's interesting, but we, as an industry, it's been a fairly successful industry for many years. So, so why change at all, I suppose? And within your organization, uh, how do we address any cultural barriers that might exist? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Obviously, um, one of the major things that's changing is the way people source healthcare, and, uh, you know, more people are taking control of, of affairs for themselves and being encouraged to, actually. It's the direction of travel with, with most health services, um, and that creates a, a bit of a dilemma for us in some ways because it means people are more informed, more demanding, um, but also they hold the information. So culturally, we need to think about how we might access that data. 
and then that runs into all sorts of problems because people are very sensitive about the data that they have and share, and rightly so. A lot of the uh, regulations and, and uh, legislation around data is out of date because it didn't envisage people holding massive amounts of information digitally on their phones. Just by turning up here, we've created a digital footprint about our activities. And not all of that's useful for risk assessment, clearly, but it does prove that I'm at least active, I'm at work, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm doing something, um, I've, been, I've been walking, I've been eating. Those are profound things about me that if I'd stayed at home uh, suffering an illness, I wouldn't have done, for example. So if I'm looking at that as a very crude example of assessment of risk, could that be useful? Yes. How do I get it? I don't know. Would someone share it with me? Possibly. There is a, some examples of people sharing this data. The Vitality uh, Rewards Scheme uh, is one that sharing fitness data cr created on uh, fitness bands and visits to the gym and so on. People will share this data if they get something back. Um, it's about creating that trust and a mechanism that keeps it safe, although we already have lots of sensitive data that we keep safe, but we need to reinforce that point. Uh, and people need to feel engaged and that they, they're going to be rewarded for it. And if they're going to get a reward scheme, they become loyal, they, they buy into the brand, which is important. But that's fine. And the only point I'd say on that whole scheme is that's nice for very fit and healthy people, but life insurance isn't just for fit and healthy people. And so the challenge is to use technology to address the needs of all the other people who aren't fit and healthy. And there's loads of opportunities for technology to provide support, wellness support, intervention, when people's health goes wrong, st stop it going wrong, uh, help them recover, get back to work. Um, so the vitality idea, uh, it shows that it can work, um, but it's using very crude kind of information to create an affinity group. Mm. But what about an affinity group that's based on chronic ill health? What data would I need? What, what would I collect? How would I assess it? I think it could be really powerful, and I think that could be the next step. I think it's a key point there that uh, companies and people will be more willing to share data if they get something in return. I mean, mm. certainly, I've been having conversations in the last two or three years which about ownership of data I never had before, um, and it's really, as we've tried to automate more or digitize, the whole question of data ownership has come up uh, where it, it wouldn't have been a problem before. Um, is, is that going to be probably the major cultural well, challenge for the industry? Do you think, I'd say two things to that. One is GDPR, which is a big problem. Yeah. Um, and the, frankly, every organization now has to provide security. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff around GDPR. If you haven't learned about it, I would. Uh, and the second for me is around incentive models. So incentive models are part of the way when I think about any, uh, getting adoption for anything that we're working on is incentive models. What, what is the incentive for a, a customer, whatever that customer is, whether it's an individual or a company, to buy that product or service or share information in this case? What, what incentive is there for them to do that? You know, and, and I think that hasn't happened well. You know, if you talk about life insurance, what's the incentive to buy life insurance? <laughs> think, you've got to think really hard. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but the story at Vitality is that as a result of their scheme to share data and to um, incentivize uh, the fit and healthy to buy their life insurance and their private medical health insurance, they've ended up with a much worse claims record because they've got oh. lots of gym bunnies who are forever getting shin splints or some you know, <laughs> dreadful affliction. And they're paying out far more in them missing work than they ever were in fat people like me who spend most of their time drinking bottles of wine. So, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the truth is you can get this data and what you expect to get from the data isn't necessarily there. Mm. And I, I just one further point, you can't move off culture in insurance where, where and only talk about the consumer because the biggest problem that the industry faces in terms of adoption of technology is its own culture. So, in, in an industry predominantly managed by an analog generation who would quite like to see out the last five years of their career. Uh, without having to go with any of this sort of digital nonsense. Uh, you know, th th that, that dynamic, when put up against the sort of stuff that you're talking about, is a real problem because the consumer is rapidly changing the way they want to engage with us and our ability to deal with it is, is deeply uh, affected by the fact that we, we don't get it because we're run predominantly by people over 50. 
Yes, I think there's a danger of underestimating just how ready people are to engage in these different ways. Um, and using excuses like legacy systems and other yeah, things is probably yeah, sure. not helping. Right, I'm running out of time. I've got one, one question, actually, which I'm going to answer, because it's... Uh, I think it relates to my broker commission comment. So are insure tech innovators going to remove broker's commission? Is that the real goal? Well, I don't know, actually. Um, I think, I think the, the challenge as a carrier we have working with our brokers is that we're seeing the insured, and we're a commercial insurer, so we deal with businesses. We're seeing the insured know a lot more about their risk than we do. And that's a definite change in the state of play uh, over time. And we see companies like utility companies that have sensors through the whole grid. They know where the real risks are ahead of us. And so carriers and brokers need to work together to come up with solutions that, that tackle uh, a much more aware insured and make sure that we tailor our insurance towards them. So I don't think the goal is to get rid of the commission. It's actually... We, we need to be offering relevant products for the right price to our customers, and that, think, that's a joint effort. I think this intermediation will happen, because it, at the end of the day, the broker, the broker has the data from the customer. If you can collect the data from the customer directly, the value of how a broker provides their services changes, and therefore the, the commissions they would get changes. If you can get the data from the customer to the, the carrier, then how the broker earns their, earns, their, earns their commission will change, I think. OK, I'm being told to stop. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much to our panel. Uh, if you'd like to give them a round of applause, that would be very grateful. Thank you.